So how's everyone doing? Great. Right. All right, so my name is Sang. I have a longer first name. That's what I go by. Uh, but you know, uh, Sang Venkatama, that's, uh, that's what I go by in the technical community, at least. So I'm based in Atlanta. I have been here for about 10, 11 years now. Um, came here after grad school and have been working in different companies, uh, you know, spend a good bit of time at Equifax, uh, working with the rules engine and some of the analytical side of things. Uh, moved on to Altasource Labs, where I was uh, architect on one of the foundation teams. Uh, then the last two years I've been working at startups. I've uh, worked on two so far, and uh, it's kind of a great job to have when you can figure out what to build and how to build it, and you kind of get to work with the latest stuff. Um, so it's been challenging, it's been great. Uh, so today I'm here to talk about natural language processing in Java. So I wanna make two disclaimers before I start. First one, natural language processing is hard. It's an extremely hard problem to solve. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, you will, um, you know, we made a lot of advances in how we can solve it, but it's still not to a state where you can just say, okay, this is done. Definitely not there yet. Second, I'm not an expert on it. So, um, you know, we have got a long ways. Uh, we've got a lot, we've done quite a bit with, uh, you know, based on where we wanted to go. But, you know, there, I'm gonna point to a lot of resources in this talk that you can look up. And everything that I've covered here that are examples, I try not to show code within the presentation. So they are all available as a GitHub project. And my drug of choice now is Scala. So they are all in Scala, but you can look at the test cases. Most of the core frameworks are still in Java. So uh, when we build Mosaic, which is what, which is how I got into natural language processing two years ago, uh, basically I had to do a deep dive because we were trying to solve a very hard problem. And when we did that, we did that purely in Java. And um, you know, increasingly I figured out that it would be nice to have something else to write that in. So all of that stuff is available. With that, let's look at the agenda. Is the font to, I mean, can you guys all see, can you all hear? Okay, sounds good. Here's English, okay, cool. I'll try to speak louder. <coughs> all right, so the talk is divided into three parts. So when I speak, to, speak about natural language to most people, most people seem to think of a search approach, right? Everyone knows search. Search has become so popular, you know, everyone knows search. So that's probably a good pretext for us to start this whole conversation in. So we're gonna first talk about text retrieval and search. We're gonna talk about implementing search. We're talk gonna talk about evaluating search results. And then we're gonna move into what I call slightly deeper natural language processing, which is document level analysis. So we kind of move out of the search paradigm and think of, okay, what is contained in a document? What is the structure of the document? What are the concepts it talks about? And I'll keep using this word concept quite a lot, but towards the end of it, I think you will kind of understand what I'm talking about. So that's what that is. Uh, so there's, there's, different, uh, you know, there's different steps in that, the document level analysis. So you, know, we, you do like a part of speech tagging, we will look at approaches for that. Uh, luckily there's libraries that do a good job with them. Uh, we will look at entity extraction, which is a whole concept of looking at a piece of text or a document and trying to see what are the different entities it references. And uh, you know, if you've been on Google recently or even like as old as a year or two, you know that Google is doing a lot of entity search matching, right? If you look for, say, Benjamin Franklin, you'll find others similar to Benjamin Franklin on the sidebar. So entity extraction is a pretty big piece of what everyone does right now. So we're gonna talk about that. The third thing we're gonna talk about is word sense disambiguation. That is probably closest to the hardest problem to solve in AI. And we will get into that and kind of figure out some of the approaches that we can do. It is a very intuitive solution. The problem has a very intuitive solution, but it is also a difficult problem to solve. Um, then we'll talk about concept extraction and finally about concept polarity. So we start with search, we go into document level analysis, and then last we'll go one step deeper, which is now we went from this whole corpus to a document and then into sentence level analysis. Again, there's really good tools in the Java framework that can do that. So we will look at document summarization. Uh, I don't know if many of you guys remember, two years ago, I think Sumly was acquired for about $30 million. And all that they were doing is summarization. So back then I didn't really know how it worked, but it's actually a very simple problem to solve for a lot of use cases. So we will look at that. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is dependency analysis and co-reference, kind of talk about what libraries are out there that can like parse out a sentence and extract some meaning from that. Uh, we'll look at an example question parsing system, look at sentiment analysis, and we'll be done. 
So one way to look at this talk is basically we go from the most global, a whole corpus-based approach to like an individual sentence-based approach, but we also go from the most proven technologies to the least proven technologies. That's also one way to look at it. The talk gets, I mean, the content gets increasingly harder as we go down. So let's talk about search, and uh, you know, feel free to interrupt me. This is a small enough room, so I think uh, we can take questions as they come up. If anything I say is not clear, just shout out. Uh, how's the hearing in the back? You guys can, it's good? Okay, great. Okay, cool. Okay, what's a text retrieval problem? The text retrieval problem is simple, right? A collection of documents exists in a system, and this collection is called the corpus. So this is the overall set of documents that exist in a system. And these documents are pre-processed and they're indexed before query time, right? That's how this is solved. Now, user performs a query, and when the user does perform a query, the user is asking for one or two concepts that they are interested in. So an example of a concept that the user may be interested in is, give me the Thai restaurants in Atlanta. Uh, so that kind of is the definition of a concept. It's something that, you know, something that resonates with the user and something that the user is looking for. Now, when the user performs a query, the search engine is expected to retrieve the most relevant documents based on a ranking function. Now, this is, uh, you know, and then also, also the search results are shown based upon some heuristic, like it is quite, this search is a very, very intensive process, and you know, most of, a lot of it is still unknown as to how it is actually implemented in a place like Google. But for the most purposes, like for the technologies that we have at hand, this is kind of the system that they follow. So you index before query time, uh, you, I mean, you pre-process an index before query time, performs a query, you look at the terms, you do some sort of a match, and you figure out the solution. So more formally, and this is kind of interesting to think of it this way because when you look into machine learning and some of the other things, you're always talking about features. Well, what's a feature in a document? In a document, the features are the terms in a document. So if you look at, if, you, if there's a sentence that says the, uh, you know, this is a room, then you have four terms over there that all compose, that are all potential features. So that's kind of how, it's a, it's a very good way to think about it. The vector space model is basically every term or set of terms becomes one dimension. So you're really looking at this in a very high dimensional space from a, uh, from a way to visualize this. Now your query vector says uh, x1 through xn are the terms that are, set, that are part of the query vector, and then the document vectors are composed of y1 through ym's. So the result that we are looking for kind of is this, is basically we're saying how the relevance of a document to a query or a query to a document is basically the similarity in this vector space between the query and the document. So if you kind of put it out in this high dimensional space and you figure out, and you can use a whole plethora of similarity measures ranging from cosine similarity to all sorts of things. But that is basically the search problem. Now how do we handle this? So we said that the basic idea of, uh, the basic part of a search is, uh, is a term, and you get the term based upon tokenization. So for every document, we split it into paragraphs and split paragraphs into sentences and sentences into words. So that's first step. The second step is word normalization. You basically take that, take take the text and make sure that things match up. So if you use uh, you know the abbreviation for USA, then you want to make sure that what comes up in the query is the same as what is in the document, so that these vectors can actually be matched. Uh, these are also usually lowercase to remove any ambiguity uh, about what we are looking for. Now, the next we apply a technique known as stop word removal, where Basically, we remove the things like is and the and all of those things that are very common in a language so that those are not part of the vectors that are being searched for. Now, this is kind of extremely important for small corpuses, but it may be optional when you have a very large document corpus. Can you think of why that may be the case? Why is stop word removal potentially optional in a very large document set? Yeah, so the techniques that we are going for, so basically the whole idea is that when, if you don't do stop, so if you have a big corpus, like think of every written word in English, right? If that was part of your corpus, then by default, the techniques that you're gonna look at, they will automatically remove the is's and the does and stuff like that because they happen everywhere. 
So this is kind of like, you know, this is very important when you're dealing with small documents, but not necessarily. So if, if so, when you say that the entire globe of documents, then you're basically talking about a corpus that matches the language model. And by default, it should be able to map that quite well. So stemming is a process of reducing terms to their stems. Again, this goes back to analyzing these as vectors, basically saying that if, if you want to compare two vectors, you want to make sure that you compare the same form of these two vectors. So stemming is language dependent. So in English, every word has uh, you know, two parts, a stem and the affix. So things like automate, automatic, automation, they all become automat. And then plural forms become cats to cat, et cetera. So uh, the, the stem may not be an actual word. So that's one of the things here. We don't really care if the stem is an actual word because we're not trying to infer anything from it. We're just trying to use that for comparison purposes. So this is that in a diagram. So you have this whole set of documents, which are here, and then you pass them through tokenization, you do stemming, and then you build inverted index, which is basically a good way to implement this stuff. So you have documents, you run them through stop word lists, you remove the ones that you're not interested in, and then you basically, you know, you basically say, okay, these are the terms, these are the IDs of the terms, and these are the documents that they belong in. What this picture doesn't cover is that you also sometimes save the position. So you usually want to save the position that the term belongs in the document so that you can ret retrieve the results correctly. So let's go through a search example and try to figure out, right? So for any term given in a query, we can find out the term frequency, which is basically the number of times a term occurs in a document. So this would be one of those cases where things like the, is, uh, et cetera, would happen so many times that they would have a very high term frequency. Document frequency is the number of documents that the term is in. So it would be the same thing for that. You know, Common terms would be in all the documents. The inverse document frequency is kind of the inverse of above. So it's basically a log function taken on uh, how common something is. So uh, your inverse document frequency will be high for less frequent terms and low for more frequent terms. And so if you really think about it, what we're trying to do with the search problem is trying to find out the distinctive parts of the term and map that vector to the, distinctive, the, to the unique parts of the documents and get a match out there. So uh, for all the terms in the query, we basically sum up the products of the term frequencies and inverse document frequencies. And this can be used to rank the results with the documents with the highest uh, TF-IDF on top. So here's a very simple example, but it kind of helps to look at a simple example. So if you had just had a sentence in the document one, which is called the rose is red, and you had red shoe in document two. And if our query was just red, then both document one and document two would provide, would be picked up because they basically would have uh, the, same number, the same number of matches once the stop words are removed. Obviously, if the query was like rose and red, and then, then you would have document one, and if it was red and shoe, you would have document two. So that's basically how that works. So in evaluating search results, so you have this stuff, you build all of this, you want to figure out how the system works. And this, this is something that we'll come back into as we go into a deeper analysis of uh, natural language processing. Right? So there are two things in an algorithm that kind of work in two different directions. And one of them is precision and the other one is recall. So the high precision basically says that you want to have very few false positives. So an example of a system like that would be where it's very critical that you don't make a wrong recommendation. So for example, if you think of like in the equivalent of this in healthcare and you're recommending that a patient or some, you're diagnosing someone with something, you want to be really sure that the diagnostics is actually valid. So that would be a case where you needed high precision. Where do you need high recall? You need high recall in systems where every missed opportunity is lost money. A good example of that is advertising, right? I mean, we all see ads that are not necessarily relevant to us, but they're trying to cast a wide net and make sure that someone sees it that is, that, and it would be relevant to them. So because these two kind of work against each other, the F measure is a harmonic mean of precision and recall, and it basically tries to map, it tries to balance the explorative nature of search with the preciseness of the results. So this is how you know something like you know Google or any one of those search engines they want to make sure that the first page is really the only page that you're seeing and it has relevant results. But at the same time, you don't have to scroll through pages and get get uh, get to finding the relevant results. So it's a kind of a balance of both of those things. So. Um, so this is just a working through of that stuff. Um, so basically, if you look at it, the, the sum of A and C is the retrieved documents. The sum of A and B is the relevant documents. 
So let's just go through a quick example that will kind of help things. So if we, if we retrieve five documents, right, and there are about 10 relevant documents for this corpus, so we send a search query, we basically received five documents. Then, and assuming that four of the five that we retrieved were actually valid, then we would have a high precision. We would have four over five, which is 0 0.8. We would have a very high precision. Our recall would be kind of low because we missed bringing in six of the documents that the user expected to see or that the system wanted to present to the user. So with this, the F-measure score becomes 0 0.53, which is kind of okay. But the whole idea is that you can look at this not just for a system in natural language processing, this is extremely applicable for a classification problem, for a machine learning problem, for any of those things, you wanna run your, uh, you wanna run your precision and recall so that you don't get too excited by initial results because things could, things could be different once you started looking at it from the other side. Okay, so basically in this section, we you know, applied NLP techniques across an entire corpus. Uh, this is really where frameworks like MapReduce come into the picture because they are able to calculate those inverted indexes. They are able to calculate that across a whole bunch of documents and provide the results that you would need so that at query time, things are really fast. Uh, the NLP techniques by themselves were shallow, but they were implicitly able to handle, like, like I was saying, if the corpus is big enough, they'll implicitly handle stop words. They also kind of implicitly handle compound words, which uh, an example of a compound word is hard drive, right? So if hard drive appears in a sentence, and if your search term and your documents have hard drive in them, it can kind of implicitly handle it because they are both part of the vector. But when we go do uh, natural language processing at the document level, that becomes slightly harder. Now, in this section, we also discussed a simple formula for ranking and retrieving search results. Uh, obviously, the, the problems, uh, the formulas that the search engines use, I'm sure are more complex than that. And they fit into one of the complex probabilistic models like uh, BM25, which you can look up but they follow the same general principles. Like they may do some normalization, they may do some re-ranking and stuff like that, but the general idea is the same. Figure out the most distinctive part of the query, make sure it matches the most distinctive part of the documents and bring up a result. So we reviewed some uh, techniques for evaluating search algorithms and these approaches can also be used for other techniques. Are there any questions with respect to what we have so far? So big data is for losers. <laughs> so this basically embodies the second part of the presentation. So we got out of the search problem, which is this, you know, you have this massive sets of data, you want to churn through all of that, but this guy is now into small data. So let's see how that goes along. So what, is it, what, what led me to all of this is basically at, at Mosaic, we were trying to figure out among other things, when you listen to a song, what are the concepts that are in, involved in a song? What kind of things does it make you think of? What is a song about? What is the central theme? Is it a song about romance? Is it a song about something else, or outdoors? Whatever the case may be. So to do that, you can't really go with a term. You cannot go with a sledgehammer and try to figure out these are the terms, these are the keywords. We can get some results, but we're not gonna get very re good results that actually make a lot of sense and help the system grow. That's the important thing. So to, to extract concepts from text, we basically do these four steps, which is basically, you know, you tokenize the sentences, you apply part of speech tagging, which, you know, it's pretty impressive that, you know, you can get a pretty good accuracy using the libraries off the shelf. Then we do concept extraction using named entities, and then we also do concept extraction using word senses. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, this is different from the search problem, right? The search problem follows a pull model, right? Where the users take initiative, they know what they're looking for, and they're asking the system that. Here, we can kind of follow a push model, which is we know what content we have, and we may be able to send it out to the right users, which is kind of a different take on it. Now, there are some ways to achieve this with a keyword-based system. So, for example, on LinkedIn, you can set up certain keywords, or on Google, Ad, what is it? Google Alerts is a system where you can set up some keywords that map to your concepts. But if you're actually able to achieve what we are talking about over here, then it means that you can have a system that truly understands language and that is able to carry that on and map that on to some concepts that humans know and understand. Okay, so this is the motivation, right? This is, these are results run on uh, more than 500,000 songs. Um, these are all unique, unique song lyrics. 
And what we found out is that most of the songs are about romance. I mean, that's kind of what we expected, but we did find that out, which is good. Um, a lot of songs talk about relationship issues. A lot of songs talk about families and relationships. Songs talk about weather. That was interesting because some of the concept that weather was mapped to was like outdoors and being out and stuff like that. Uh, so they, outdoors and weather share some concepts. Uh, religion and belief came up quite a bit. Uh, people and society, apparel. So, you know, like the Macklemore song would be an example of that. Uh, autos and vehicles. We have a song list of over a thousand songs that basically talk about cars. Uh, friendship, travel, finance, all of this. So the, this is obviously not an official projection. This is how our algorithm was able to churn through all of these songs and figure out what concepts uh, were emanating from these songs. So this is what we are trying to work towards. Okay, so to achieve that, we said we're gonna do four things. Uh, basically, one of them is sentence segmentation. Uh, periods are ambiguous because they are part of abbreviations, decimals, et cetera. Uh, you know, some of the other punctuations are less ambiguous. Uh, but we can use something off the shelf, you know, like Stanford NLP has a sentence detector and a tokenizer. So it's basically been trained on what is known as a pen bank, uh, and it's a data set that's been completely labeled. So they were able to use that to train the classifier and help it recognize sentence ends. It still doesn't do a perfect job, but sentence detection is not such a hard problem to solve. You know, you have so many use cases, and you can get around that. Um, also going to talk briefly about open NLP. So for those of you that are aware, open NLP is like an Apache licensed product. From my understanding, I don't know if it's getting as much active development. And in general, if you take away one thing from this talk is that if you're doing natural language processing using Java, you need to look at Stanford NLP. Because these are the guys, those are the professors that basically have are on the cutting edge of what's happening and it's in Java, and I think they even have like a Java 8 version already out. So if you're trying to do any of that stuff, go with Stanford NLP. Their license is somewhat interesting. I have emailed them. I mean, if you email them and you can, you can talk to them, you can even do it for commercial uses as long as you don't distribute that software. So uh, didn't see a problem with uh, using that at all. The next step is you got sentences. Now, we want to see what parts of speech different things belong to. So this is how we move away from the term model, right? Now, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. You can now look at it in a different way and see that these are the words and they have different usages based upon where they are in the sentence. So there's basically, there's about 40 different tags that can be applied to a part of speech. And you know, I'm covering the main ones here, which is the determiner, the adjectives, the nouns, the proper nouns, the pronouns, uh, verbs, preposition, and conjunction. So, you can do all of that. You can basically pass out a sentence, and Stanford NLP will will basically give you um, the part of speech tagging. One thing to note whenever you use any of these libraries is that they have all been trained on formal language. So if this is not SMS speak. This is not text speak. So this will not scale just as well to those. So one of the things that we had to do when we were working with song lyrics is to do some pre-processing. So we took out. We, we had to make sure that as part of the pipeline, we had something in there that would take the lyrics, make sure that some of the punctuations and some of the cases were handled beforehand. And that was necessary to kind of go ahead and achieve that. So when you were training that for, on the song, how did it handle different, say, genres and dialects? So you've got like different kinds of language usage and say hip hop versus right. country music. Yeah, so, so we didn't, that's, that's what we should have done if we wanted more accurate results. So we were able to get a reasonable amount of accuracy without going through the individual stuff. So we basically just pre-processed and used their training, uh, their train models. But we all, I had also tried out training by myself. It's just that it wasn't feasible for us to provide enough supervised data for us to do that. So if you have the time and if you have the, if you have the resources to actually go in and do like the equivalent language of what you're looking at, that's recommended because it will vary. And for us, it was partially that this was kind of a difficult problem to solve to begin with. So we wanted to see how far we can get without going into individual and trying to get like one, two percent improvements. But that's, that would have been the way to do it. And both uh, Stanford NLP and Open NLP allow you to retrain the models. Um, okay, so we're done with that. Move to the slightly more fun part of this stuff, which is 
named entity recognition. So you look at you look at terms, you look at these sentences, and you can you can kind of see what is mentioned. Like you know, there may be a, there may be a song that mentions Atlanta. In fact, we found that there were about hundred songs that mentioned Atlanta Braves. So mentioned it in different ways. There's about 20 songs, if I remember right, that mentioned Georgia Tech. So you can have all of this, and what's interesting about named entity recognition is that it doesn't have to be the sp fully spelled out form. It can be like GA Tech is picked up, as long as a statistical model, which is what we're gonna talk about, as long as that statistical model is able to figure out that this is what the spot corresponds to, they can do that. So there's three steps involved in named entity recognition. So first step, is, is something that Open NLP and Stanford NLP will do, which is spotting. So you kind of build, based on a training set, it kind of builds a prob probabilistic context-free grammar and kind of figures out, based on the structure, what are the different likely spots in a sentence, right? And it also has a whole bunch of training data, right? It's used the pen bank and uh, other resources. And I think for named entity recognition, there's, uh, I can't, I can't remember, it's called like call, colonel or something like that. There's, there's about eight data sets that they use and they train it on different classes. So there's something known as a three class trainer, there's a seven class trainer, there's a caseless training model. So you have different models that have been used for named entity recognition. So the first part is spotting. And to help with spotting, it kind of helps that the data has seen something like it or has actually seen the spot before. Now, once spots are found, you do what is known as disambiguation. So disambiguation is basically saying that, you know, there's, I think, 14 decaders in the USA, right? How do you figure out which decader was mentioned in a song or a document? You really don't know. So disambiguation is a process of taking a spot, trying to figure out what are the things that we know that it can match to. And once you figure that out, you basically, and after Stanford NLP, the second thing that I want everyone to take away from this talk is graphs are amazing you will see that every problem that we have to solve, we will be solving with a graph approach. It's either directly through us or it's through a library, because, uh, I'll, and I'll, I'll talk about it later, so that'd be the second takeaway, is that disambiguation is literally a graph problem. If we can figure out what nodes are connected to what other nodes, and you can kind of figure out what the song is talking about. The third step is, um, would be filtering, which is basically the process of removing certain entities that we are not interested in. So uh, just to give you an idea, and I talk about this later, like Wikipedia has about 4.5 million and 4.5 things that it knows about, and there's 580 million facts about it. So it knows about 4.5 things, and it knows about properties of this is about 500 million. So it's a lot of knowledge out there, a lot of information out there. So one of the things that you need to do if you're building a system and you want to solve a specific problem is to filter out the results. So at the end of named entity recognition, we get a set of URLs. So we said there were three steps. Stanford NLP and Open NLP do the first step. So you can look at this right now, you can look at it at your own leisure, but the whole idea being that it knows about locations, organizations, and I wanna say people, even though I don't have an example over here that does people. So, you know, it can look at a sentence, and obviously this is uh, the annotated part of the sentence. The raw sentence obviously do not, does not have the organization or the location. So if you run these sentences through the Stanford NLP, it will annotate these and say that GM is an organization. So Stanford NLP is also good in the sense that it can handle cases slightly better. It's also probably because of the data it was trained on. It, it, it figured out Chevy even though it was lower cased. Uh, Open NLP missed that. Um, so. So spotting in general is, is something that both these can do, uh, but I would not use either of this to solve this problem because there's a better solution out there, but these can be used to enhance that. The solution out there that can solve this problem is known as DBpedia Spotlight. So DBpedia as an organization is uh, basically the people that work on DBpedia tend to be around the world, but it's mainly in Europe. Germany is a big hub of DBpedia and like, well, there's a lot of development happening there. A um, couple of universities um, take the lead on this. So DBpedia is basically the back end part of Wikipedia. So they take Wikipedia data and everything that's in the info box that you see in Wikipedia is basically extracted out and pushed into a store that can be queried for later and that's DBpedia. So DBpedia Spotlight is a natural language processing library built on top of DBpedia, which helps with all three of these steps. So uh, it identifies spots, uh, then it also disambiguates the spots because they have a statistical backend that does that. 
uh, and then you basically retrieve the URIs for each of the identified name entities. So these are usually DBPD URLs with references to others such as Freebase. Extreme, ex uh, another thing worth mentioning is Freebase. So Freebase, um, I think in about 2008, 2010 maybe, Google acquired MetaWeb. And MetaWeb had built this big knowledge base called Freebase that Google acquired when they acquired MetaWeb. And they have kept it up. And Freebase is the data source behind Google's knowledge graph. So all the entity extraction that happens on Google's knowledge graph and the stuff that they're constantly building. So they have an extremely well-connected library for, I mean, the well-connected data set of like music and all sorts of possible things. And all of that is backed by this. So there's a bunch of API that you can use uh, to do spotting, disambiguation, annotation, and then you can also get a candidate list for different, ca uh, different spots. Okay, is this too small? Can you see? It is. No, no, it's very much around, and they are actually building that. But uh, the the part that Google uses is knowledge graph, and I think Freebase is the publicly available part of that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on the Freebase. I'm sorry, it says uh, Aiden shutdown. Oh, okay. Then it must be getting shut down. <laughs> uh, I mean, um, yeah. So. Most of what I've done with Freebase has been through DBpedia. So when all of these ontologies come up, they try to link each other because they're same entities and it doesn't make too much sense to duplicate their information. Uh, so the last time Freebase was active, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't checked in the last three, four months. Okay, so this, is go this goes back to the original slide about evaluating search results. So when you build a system like this, one of the things that you want to make sure is that it gets the results that you want, right? So at Music, we basically built a data set that was hand annotated that we took, picked a whole bunch of songs from. And we said, these are the things that are mentioned in these songs. And we ran it through these, uh, through these systems to make sure that we get something back. So um, I'm just bringing up five examples here. Um, there's these five songs. There's a song called Kodachrome. There's a brand new Cadillac song. Uh, there's a certain monkeys and then my hums, which talks about a whole bunch of fashion stuff, which uh, I probably don't know too much about. Uh, so, so if you look at each one of these rows of data, you can see that we expect for the first song we expect Pizza Hut and 7-Eleven and all of that. We get one of those. We get Nikon on the second one. We get Cadillac on the third one. We get the shoes on the fourth one, and we get two of the six uh, six brands. So what you can see with the system is because I had actually set some filtering on it, is that it's very precise. All the results that comes back are very relevant results, but there are things it misses. And that's actually one of the reasons why I was also thinking of using Freebase when it was active, is because they had a bigger library of things that they knew about, so you could download that and add it to the index and stuff like that. So, um, so the overall measure is that I would say on any kind of any of these systems, uh, a 75% accuracy, like the F measure, is a really good goal to go for. Uh, you know, this is a test set, and this test set is actually available on the GitHub project that you can look at. Um, we get point, 0 0.73 is not too bad, but anywhere between around 75 is where I feel comfortable that we have a system that can produce good results. And the the most interesting thing with with F measure, if you try to use that, is that it's if any one of precision or recall is low, it'll make that F measure number very low. So it's uh, as you get over 75 and 80 percent, that hump is, gets harder and harder because you need to make sure that your system handles both the exploration and the and the preci precision well. So and then this is just a follow-up slide about the semantic web. Um, this by and off itself is a big conversation which I don't want to have. So there are experts on this field. They spend all their time on this stuff. I've been hearing about semantic web for about 15 years. I don't know about you guys. Uh, but it's, it's always been there. Uh, you know, one of the biggest and best resources for that is DBpedia, obviously. So I'm just showing you an example of what is known as a Sparkle query. And Sparkle is basically the equivalent of SQL for RDF stores. So the, 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 the ontologies, as these are called, they follow a very specific format. And the format is subject, predicate, and object. So for those of us that are used to graph databases and stuff like that, these seem like a small step back, but in reality, they are not. 
So people that can write powerful Sparkle queries can go from one node to the other. They can do stuff on relationships and uh, they can do filtering on relationships and all of that. I personally, when I deal with this kind of data, I just like to put it in a graph database, get some sort of, you know, if it's Neo4j, get Cypher running or I use Titan and all of that stuff. So, but it's worth looking at uh, and and so this particular query is interesting because this is one of the ways where how we extract a concept from a song or any any text. So for example, Fendi is a fashion, uh, is basically, it belongs to the fashion industry. So if you wanna know what a song is talking about, if you wanna know certain concepts about something and they mention something, you can look up and make run a query and figure out what it's talking about. Um, and we'll talk later about how to map all of this back. Right, let's see if we can do a demo. This was down today, okay? This is not something I've written. Um, this is basically just something out there. Okay, do you guys wanna throw out a sentence that we should put in here to see if DBPDA Spotlight can figure it out? I like to eat Pizza Hut. Let's see if it can figure it out. Uh, as soon as I can find the submit button. There it is. So the World Wide Web and the DBPD and all of that, they know about Pizza Hut. They found out it's an American restaurant chain, international franchisees, blah, 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 owned by PepsiCo. So if you get really good at Sparkle and if you get good at this stuff, yeah. So what we did at Mosaic is we basically uh, set up a Virtuoso instance, which was our own data store. We were making a lot of these queries and it was important for us to have availability and things like that. So I would recommend going down the same direction if this is something that uh, you're doing a lot of. Which one? Uh, it is not super large because this stuff was uh, was basically hosted on one extra large Amazon instance. Yeah, it's not bad, yeah. It, it's, so most of this data is indexed data and it's very optimized storage. So they have that RDF triple store world is a world that has been there forever and they have optimized a lot of those things. It's just that it's not out there so much. So it's basically like relational databases for this kind of stuff. But you know, uh, we have done that and we've also, uh, we haven't moved all that data to Neo4j, but Neo4j is pretty good too about that stuff and then you can use other distributed stores as well. Okay, so let's try some other query. Uh, this time we can say, uh, back to text. like a tried and tested example. If I can spell. Okay, hit annotate. So that, that should obviously be able to pick it up. Pretty sure, oh, it missed it. Oh, that's interesting. All right, you, you guys can look at it. Um, it's pretty much there, it's available, it's got a friendly license and you can use that as either as a REST API or you can bring that into your own system. Okay, so this is one part of the concept extraction conversation. <coughs> this was the easier part. So let's try to go through the next one which is slightly more complex than this. Right. Because uh, our digital dogs both of the stock words or the both of the nodes. <coughs> so in this particular case, it doesn't really matter because it's just trying to find a spot. So this system is not necessarily about finding stop words. This is basically a spotting system, which that structure of that sentence is pretty well known. So they should be able to handle that. So that's like a normal well, structure. Why isn't it better the same thing and delivering the word and dog? Do you think the same result? We can give it a shot. I'm actually getting no results for this, which is weird because I think the default one had something uh, like that. <coughs> yeah, I, I know that they had been having some problems today, but yeah, just taking some time to refresh. But in general, something like that should work. Okay. Right. 
Wilson's disambiguation. So first of all, we should not really try to solve this if we don't have to, but it is, it, the, the idea behind this is pretty intuitive, and this is basically the overall idea of how we would extract concepts from anything. Right? So the whole problem with word sense disambiguation is simple. Right? For many words, there are multiple senses of a word. So if you look at the word bank, there's actually 10 different senses of the word bank if you look into WordNet uh, for a noun. So there's a lots of senses of words. Now, it doesn't really affect us if you're talking about one language, but when you talk about multiple languages, words and the surface form of the words have no significance. What matters is what they imply and the concepts that they imply. So words and disambiguation is very important when you're trying to do machine a translation between languages, you're trying to do information retrieval, and we're trying to do automated uh, annotation of text. A lot of people don't do words and disambiguation, and the reason that they don't do it is because the the accuracy rate is about 60, 65%. And it's not the greatest accuracy rate. You spend a lot of effort into solving something, which most people can just get away with like a keyword. You know, there is a, there is a rough way to do it which works. So why try to solve it this way? But we were trying to understand what, what the con content and what the, what the basic underlining concept was. So it was kind of important for us to try to figure this out. So to solve the words in this ambiguation problem, we need two things. We need an inventory. This is the knowledge base that basically has all the context of the different words and what they can mean and things like that. This is usually a graph structure. Um, an example of that is WordNet. Uh, Wikipedia is an example of that. Yago is an ex example of that. Freebase, ConceptNet. These are all data sets that are available out there that have a lot of contextual knowledge. Then what you do is once you have those data sets, you basically get the algorithms and you try to traverse the inventory to find the most likely disambiguation. So you basically say, okay, if based on this graph and based on the nodes that it is connected to, this is the best sense of the word that we can find. Wilson's disambiguation makes two assumptions. What, the first assumption is that the document has enough context. So if you have a very short document, if you have like one line and that has no context, this is gonna fail really bad. So you really need to have some sort of a context of what the document is talking about to understand what it is saying. And then the second assumption that it makes, and it's more of an implementation detail, is because it says that it's a single sense per discourse. So you cannot use bank as a financial institution on your first sentence, and bank as the bank of a river on your third sentence, because this, the system would not be able to figure it out. It will try to treat both of them the same way, which makes it harder. Maybe in the future, the algorithms will do a better job with that, but for now, it doesn't happen. So, talked about Stanford NLP, talked about DBPDS Spotlight. How many of you have heard of WordNet? Heard of what WordNet? Yeah, WordNet, you've heard of WordNet. To me, it was something that I'd heard of, I really didn't know what it was. And it's one of those kind of like secrets in, this, uh, in the language processing world. Powers a lot of things, it's been, it's been a project that people have worked on since 1985. They have built quite a bit to it. In the recent times, they haven't had too much development, but what they have done, and this is not just for English, it applies to multiple languages. They have basically taken uh, the language, the natural form of language and how it has evolved, and mapped it onto a big old graph. And what they have also done is they have established relationships that can go up and down this whole graph, and they also have other relationships between these words. So. It basically covers words that belong to the four parts of speech. It's nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. And then um, you know, words are separated into senses. So in the natural language processing speak, a sense of a word is basically the connotation or the context of that particular word. And the word net senses are defined by, I mean, word net senses are defined by sensets. And sensets are connected by well-defined semantic relationships. So majority of the word net relationships are within the same part of speech. And the link down is for the library that I would recommend to use WordNet with. Uh, it's a rewritten form of an older library, but that really works well. Okay. If you went into WordNet and searched for the word bank, you would get 10 senses of the word bank for the noun, and you'd have about seven over there, or seven or eight, eight for the verb, of the, for the verb bank. So uh, it was pretty impressive that there's so many uses of one word. Right, and you, as you see across, right, the bank, the first bank is the bank of a river, and the second bank is a financial institution. And as you go down the list, there are some that I may not even recognize at all. So, those are the different forms. Uh, those are the different senses of the same word 
that we try to infer based upon the context. Why is it important? It is important because if you try to inf if you get the correct sense of the word, then you can get the correct context of what the, where the word belongs and extrapolate some abstract concepts from a document or a song or whatever it is. So we follow a simple format. It's a base form hash part of speech tag hash index. So that would be index one on top over there, bank hash one, and the last one is index 10. And uh, there is a search available. You can go into WordNet and search for things and you'll find the answers over there. So this is a fully human uh, hand annotated dictionary. Okay. Yes, so this is not automated. This, this resource out there is something that people have worked on for a long time. So they've actually looked into the language and figured out what the different uses are. So we are there at version 3.1 right now. So a lot of words have gotten added based upon common usage. So for example, hard disk is present there. There are even some proper nouns present there, but this is manually done. So this is, yeah. So this is not automated at all. So that's why it's kind of interesting that, you know, um, when I was working on this stuff and I would talk to people and they'd be like, yeah, we do some natural language processing. We look at synonyms. And I'm like, yeah, that's good, but that's like the first step of what you would do. Uh, you can explore resources like this that really go into depths of language. Uh, it's there for, uh, I'm sure uh, five, six other languages. Um. Can, can you search for engrams in, in this? So that's a good question. So the answer to that is you can search for engrams in that, but your processing has to handle that correctly. So for example, if you find an engram, you need to drop the other two. So for example, hard disk, right? Hard disk would be an engram of size two. You can find that in WordNet. Uh, but from our point of view, you need to remove the other two hard and disk from your tokens so that in the future processing, they are not part of the list. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, it's part of pre-processing. And it's something that, you know, that's the other thing. Like when you do a processing at an individual document level, you kind of have to watch out for all of those things. Now, <coughs> figuring out what an engram is is not a trivial task. So because you'll have documents in which, so there's a couple of approaches you can do to figure out engrams, one of which is a conditional probability approach where you try to see, do these words always happen together or do they occur separately ever? Once you try to figure that out, you can apply some sort of a conditional probability, but for that, it kind of helps to do that for an entire corpus as opposed to an individual document. But uh, you know, if you, if you went into this link and basically, uh, let me see if it comes up. This is, okay, let's look at that. Yeah, so it figured that out. And these are the, so, and the ones that you see on the horizontal line are the different word surface forms that actually map to the same meaning. So hard D-A-S-C is the same as hard disk, which is the same as fixed disk. So these are the different surface forms. So when you're looking into concept analysis, the surface form really doesn't matter. It's what shows up in the document. What matters is the underlining context of what that signifies. Okay, so we did that. Relationships, not gonna go into too many details, but the two main relationships in WordNet are is a relationship. So if you, if you think of WordNet as a tree, so basically here, car is a type of motor vehicle Ambulance is a type of car, and funny wagon, which is an ambulance used to transport patients to a mental hospital, is a type of ambulance. So you can walk down that list, and you will go into more and more specific forms of that particular inset. So this is how uh, there is another big field of research, which I won't go into here, is semantic similarity. You can take two words in WordNet and say, how similar are these words? And there are all sorts of graph algorithms that help map that similarity out. Um, so. Uh, the other, the, the opposite of a hypernym, which is what that is a relationship is, is a hyponym, which is like a mango is a hyponym of fruit. So it's basically, it's a child, uh, it's, a, <coughs> it's the other side of the is a relationship. There are other relationships in WordNet like is a synonyms, antonyms, etc. cetera. Right, so this would be an example of that. So motor vehicle is like that do dotted line signifies that it's not a direct child of artifact. There's like a couple of layers in between and then uh, um, there's different cars. So looking into WordNet, the, one of the other guys that was working with me, he was really digging into all of this stuff 
And it was kind of helpful to have two people go at it, but in general, this is a very good resource, but to get the right sense is not very trivial. So how do you access WordNet in Java? You can access WordNet in Java using a library known as exe.jwnl. We already talked about that. It's just a matter of downloading those data, the data set. You can boot up your dictionary. So the two important things in this library is this thing called the dictionary and the morphological processor. So that morphological processor can take the raw form of a word and go into WordNet and find out what it maps to. Last thing that happens here is a process known as lemmatization. Lemmatization is different from stemming. The difference is that stemming was a purely programmatic process. It's just about going, okay, we have two S's, we chop them off. We have something else, we chop them off. It's, it, it, is a, it is a process that you know, has no significance on what the context is whatsoever, but lemmatization is a dictionary process. You go to the word in a dictionary and you say, what's the lemma of this word? And you get something back for that. So that's what that is about. So the difference between the lemma and the stem, is the stem might not necessarily be a word, but the reference. Yeah, lemma is usually the word, yeah. Um, or always the word, I haven't seen anything that uh, it, it is not. And the lemma, the, more, the other important difference between that is that lemma has some sort of significance. Like you can look at it and get some sort of idea of what it is talking about. Whereas a stem like the consolid or something like that, maybe something that doesn't give you any information. So lemma is a dictionary process. Okay. Uh, word sense disambiguation using WordNet. So you can use any one of these graphs and you can try to figure out the context of the words, <laughs> right? So we saw the bank example. There's so many implementations out there. Uh, this is something that I came upon recently and I probably will have to move this to GitHub because uh, they have deployed on Google code uh, and which is uh, it's not something that's not being maintained. But um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is from a university somewhere, I can't remember where, but this is pretty good code. We have seen some commercial implementations and this code actually performed better than that. And all that they are really doing is using graph centrality measures. They are basically taking this whole graph, they're mapping out the words there. So a simple way to solve the words in disambiguation, at least to think about it is this, right? In a document, you have so many words which only have one sense. Like in the second example, the credit union has one sense and one sense only. If you look it up in WordNet, you'll get credit union noun one. So in your first round of graph, you can basically say everything that has one sense only become permanent nodes in this graph. And then you can go from there and you can search for words and see how many of the other words that you connect to and eventually build this connected graph that then you can go look up at degree centrality or eigenvectors and things like that and figure out what the biggest nodes are. So in some ways, this is similar to the, uh, what's it, hub, uh, I forgot, the hits algorithm which is basically figuring out something, the hub and activators and stuff like that. The concept is very similar. You're just trying to find out. Most of the graph approaches, in my mind, boil down to one thing. You're trying to find the influential nodes. And in words since disambiguation, you basically take that influential nodes and map it back to the word that you were looking at. Okay, so finally, we are out of that. So the whole introduction to words since disambiguation was because that, A, to let you guys know that something like that is available, but B, because it's, it's kind of the right approach to take if you're trying to do a deeper analysis of a document. So uh, WordNet does not, ca uh, but there are some disadvantages to WordNet as well. WordNet models a language very well, but it doesn't capture any common sense information. For example, if you try to compare the bank and wor money in WordNet, you'll find that they are far apart. They are about 13 nodes apart. So they are not well related at all. So we can use something else like ConceptNet to map these ontologies, uh, to map the relationships in WordNet and provide that information. So that is all called common sense mapping, which has been around for about 30 years. So there's projects like Psych and Open Psych and all of that. This all falls into a similar category. Here's what we did at Mosaic to solve this problem, right? We created a custom concept graph. What's a custom concept graph? You start with a base graph. In our case, we started with WordNet. We could have started with anything. Then you basically deploy content concept mappings to the WordNet census. Because in this example, we know that money and bank are related. We could tie something that ties those two together, and that would be part of our concept map. We also then added mappings for relevant Wikipedia DB, uh, DBPDA categories. So in the first pass, we go try and capture what entities are mentioned in the song or in the text, and then we basically use that information with the census to go into our custom concept graph and figure out what concepts we need to bring out. Okay, so we have a real-time analysis API, right? More, a lot of the other stuff, especially words in disambiguation, at least with the library we were using, tends to be a, a, tends to be a processing intensive task. 
So we built a concept graph beforehand, and that concept graph is updatable, and we did that using our Neo4j, and it was fine. It was, it was running on one instance. We didn't really have to scale that up beyond that uh, because it was efficient, and our data set hadn't still reached that level of scale. We, we dropped WordNet 3.0 on it. We dropped some interesting entities from DBP, interesting categories. We truly map categories. We didn't really map each entity because when we do named entity recognition, we were able to filter out the categories that we were interested in. Yeah. Well, so we we were not doing machine learning for any of this stuff. So it was a very simple process of querying DBpedia, looking for those category information, and just looking. So in fact, for, for some of these things, it was really simple because we could just say, for example, for cars, we could just look at DBpedia property and say if it's an automobile, and we map the automobile DBpedia category to something that we know about. So. So at runtime or at this batch processing time, when we found an entity that was like a Mercedes or something that had an automobile category tied to it, then it was very easy for us to do. So uh, we didn't try to reinvent the wheel on that at all, but we did have a deployment where all of this was running and that was the whole job was to build this concept graph. Um, and then for our stuff, we just used a document database, MongoDB fit the bill, uh, anything else could have, we could have used even Elasticsearch or something like that, it didn't really matter. Uh, so the, the idea was simple, we would get a whole bunch of text every so often, we would trigger our NLP engine, which would look up our database, pull up a whole set of documents, run it through the concept graph, which was actually pretty fast. The biggest task, uh, time-taking task in this whole thing was words and disambiguation. Um, and you know, we, we necessarily didn't have to do it that way. We could have also gone with a more of a surface form approach and did some graph mapping ourselves, but that's an uh, approach we chose, uh, chose. The whole idea being that, you know, eventually when you're looking for central concepts, they are gonna be connected in one graph database or the other. When a real-time request comes in, we don't do anything, any processing for the tech stuff because we are able to just go to Mongo, pull that up, we'll do some real-time analysis and send the data back out. Right. So uh, that is always part of our corpus, correct? So in our case, the text wasn't always coming in. There's usually like dumps of either lyrics or some interaction text or something like that. So we were able to achieve all of that in a batch mode. So every so often, like every Wednesday or something, we would get a whole dump of this stuff. We would do all of this analysis and push it to our Mongo database and basically have that tagged saying that this is the latest analysis. So for us, it was important that, you know, we didn't, we, for us, what was important was that we were trying to enhance our NLP engine, so we would try to version our results and try to provide the latest versions. So we would take a subset, so we would go in here, so we had a couple of processes, so when we made changes to the algorithm, we would go back to our hand annotated data set. So that was that, for the named entities, it was that big Excel spreadsheet with all the things that we expect. And same thing for concept mapping, we would see if we made improvements on that. We try to choose a representative set that we could test that on, and then we would basically uh, deploy a new version of the algorithm, do all of this analysis, and tag the results as corresponding to that algorithm so we knew what we had done. So if, you, if for example, if we had a bad analysis, we could discard that later. So again, I'm showing the same slide again, but I think after all of this conversation, this kind of makes more sense, is that we had our own graph, we were able to figure out all of these relationships, we were also able to write some custom algorithms for this purpose, uh, and the whole idea is that then we, we were able to provide both uh, overall dashboard results like this, but also the individual document level, we were able to figure out what concepts were mentioned there, with the idea being that we could, you know, we could use that to do more things. All right, so the last part of this second section is talking about um, concept polarity. This is again something, just one slide out there, something that if people are working on this stuff, it's good for you to be aware. Uh, so the hub for all the disambiguation stuff, and I think even this is like a university in Italy, there's one professor there that's doing a lot of this using WordNet. And what this particular project has done is they've taken every sense defined in WordNet and defined it with a polarity. So you, for example, you can, if you say, if you have that sentence, they are really happy to be here, the happy would disambiguate to the adjective form of happy, and it's got a very positive polarity. So now you can look at a document and you can say, what are the top positive things mentioned in the document? What are the top negative things mentioned in the document? The, the, all of this is great if you get your words in disambiguation right, which basically means that you need to point to the right inventory and 
get the right results going. But this is a good resource, and you know, I think I have like a small test case that does this part of it. Okay, so the summary of section. Uh, we went beyond surface forms, which was what the first problem, search and text retrieval was. We stayed at the surface level, considered the terms to be the vectors that we were interested in. But here we go a level deeper and we try to figure out what are they actually mapped to? Can we get enough context information, right? The biggest thing, and I think this, uh, you know, if you guys have uh, looked at the Facebook graph search and things of that nature, I mean, there are more and more work has been done. As, if I remember right, the Facebook graph search team worked on it for about three years before they were able to release something that kind of understood natural text. So by no means is NLP like a simple task, but it's increasingly becoming, I would say, it's easier just because of what is available out there. Um, so yeah, so map it to common sense knowledge base, and then you can also now, what you can do is you can also compare two documents based upon the concept that they contain. You can look at a sem semantic similarity measures between documents, and you can get that. So that is the end of this section. So are there any questions while we're on it? Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Does, does the topic of artificial intelligence relate to, uh, to, to, to what we're talking about this evening in any way? Um, I think yes and no. Uh, it, it does in a certain way because AI is a loaded term, so I won't use it, but in general, the idea is kind of similar. You're trying to basically figure something. In a lot of ways, we are trying to, in this case, we are trying to back, work our way backwards into what someone was thinking when they were writing about something. So in that case, I would say yes, but the way we do it is a very, this is not a machine learning approach. Nothing I've shown here is machine learning. And that was a specific decision that we made. We didn't want like a black box system out there that was churning out results. We were trying to do a deeper analysis of the, uh, the language itself and trying to figure out what we could get. So I wouldn't necessarily put it in AI category, but the ideas still apply. Yeah. Would you consider using FrameNet for your concepts? Sorry? Would you consider using FrameNet for your concepts? I've seen FrameNet, but I can't recollect what we did with that. Can you talk a little bit more about FrameNet? It might be coming from a similar community as WordNet, so uh, many linguists are contributing to it. Uh, and the idea of a frame is a linguistic idea. Um, and I, I think uh, maybe some of the other concepts and nets that you're looking at are coming from other communities, like psychologists or uh, the semantic web community. But um, frame net, uh, a frame is maybe, say, uh, you take a verb like um, well, withdraw money or something, withdraw, right. and uh, the frame would be withdrawing money from the bank. So this immediately relates the two words. Uh, okay, so the closest thing that I can think of in that is concept net. So concept net has got relationships like that. Uh, I think I've seen frame and I don't really know if I've tried anything with it. But we haven't tried frame net. Okay, the, the, my other question is, um, did you have a way to, to uh, make sure that your, your concepts are well distributed? So for example, if you, if you start with the concept Auto, um, you could break it up into cars and trucks, and that will radically change your your uh, statistics if you uh, like factor out your concepts um, in different ways. Or you could break it up as uh, like parking and driving instead of autos. Um, so, is, do you have a way of uh, of yeah distributing your concepts uh, even? All right, so. I think I have the answer to one part of the question, which is, uh, which is something I didn't really talk about here. Our concepts can be hierarchical. So you can have um, cars and trucks that belong to automobiles, and that kind of matches up with like, you know, some of the other resources out there. So, and we basically leveraged, we basically wrote some part of the graph algorithm where we were able to figure out those child-parent relationships, but the underlying ideas were the same. So for example, we were able to figure out even with the approach that we took, so you can have this case where you have automobile, which is a parent of both cars and trucks, but we can still tell with a good level of accuracy if the song is more about cars, more about trucks, or more about both in general. So, and all of that follows network analysis principles. So if you look, um, so the way to think about that is, if I bring six friends to the party, right, and you're my only friend, no, let's think of it this way. I'm your only friend. I bring six friends to the party, and they all bring different people. 
who's got the most influence in this graph? It's probably me because I'm bringing in way more people and my network is much larger. So we use some of the similar concepts in achieving right. that. So, so you're building an ontology on the fly. Basically, but, but that is something that, you know, uh, that is something that um, graphs handle implicitly too. We just made sure that we accounted for that fact. We wanted to make sure what was triggered in our wave up. So it was not just, so even, even as we build a hierarchical system, it was not just saying the top hierarchies would always get the most score. It really depended upon, uh, we used some analysis from graph theory to figure out where we are. Does that, does that, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, that's sort of the, the question I'm asking, but I guess more, more mathematically, is there a, a metric on that uh, concept graph? Because Centrality. If, if, if the graph is human made, then maybe they just like build out a certain part of it more. And so your, your like friends example, well, like if I bring friends, if you bring friends, you can compare like friends are the same sort of thing maybe. But uh, in the concept graph, yeah, you have a sense of like distance between concepts. That's a good question. So for example, WordNet is extremely not a balanced graph. So that's just the nature of what we, so I don't know necessarily know if, if we try to add that to it. But in general, uh, I think the things that happen in nature, except like DBP is probably slightly more balanced than WordNet, but we found what you're talking about a lot with WordNet. So for example, a good, uh, good observation there is if you start looking into the biological parts of WordNet, you will have so many layers of specificity going deeper and deeper. But when you look at some other parts of WordNet, it's very sparse. So that's something that WordNet had, uh, but we didn't necessarily I don't think we were trying to solve for that, but we had a layer on top of it, which was kind of balanced, but I don't know if there's a metric for that. So the answer is, for first thing is that, should we try to balance it, right? So a lot of these ontologies, they map what happens in real life, and sometimes real life is not about balance all over the nodes. Like for example, you do have, in like when you get into biology and stuff like that, you do have very specific ways, and I think that one of the ways that people try to overcome that is basically by providing a semantic measure that takes it into account. So, and there is, there's seven semantic related algorithms that are out there, in my opinion, none of them work perfectly because they all account for something, but they lose out on something else. So the short answer to that question is it's just the nature of what we're dealing with. But I think something like DBpedia, uh, if you look at DBpedia, the top five classes I think are places and um, something else, organizations, places, and stuff like that. And even there, it's like about they have much more on one and then on the other. So I don't know if you'll ever get to that. Yeah, but good question. All right, so. With that, we're done with the document level analysis. Now we're gonna try to figure out if we can provide a summarization system. So what's a document summary? A document summary is basically trying to say what, what is the most important points in an original document? So if you have a 500 word document and you wanna find out what are, the big, what are the important things that I can pick from here that would be representative of the document. There's basically two approaches to document summarization and uh, you know, the first one is called the extractive approach where you basically extract the sentences that are most representative of the content of the document. And the second one is a generative approach where it's basically that, in my mind, is closer to AI where you're trying to rewrite, uh, some, uh, rewrite certain sentences to make it more easily, easy for the human to understand. Almost all the work is on extractive. So most document summarization systems out there are extractive. I don't know how Sumly works uh, or any of the other commercial grade systems, but most of them tend to be extractive. The generative is harder, but I think that with all of the semantic analysis, the generative may be possible at some point. So, and then the other point with summarization is that it's somewhat subjective because even a couple of humans cannot agree on what a good summary is. It really depends upon what you're doing, especially on the generative side. On the, on the extractive side, I think people can more or less agree, but they may still differ in opinion as to what is better. So there, there are two simple approaches that do this. Uh, one of them is based on term frequency, and the second one is based on sentence similarity. I'm not gonna talk much about the term frequency one, uh, except this. The term frequency approach basically says this. 
It, it tries to figure out what the mo most common terms in a document are after removing all the stop words. That's extremely important. Once it does that, it tries to figure out those sentences that have the most representation of these words. So it's kind of like a naive approach almost, but it, it kind of works because if you think about, uh, think of like, you know, there's an example coming up, but uh, think of like Apache Cassandra, a document that describes Apache Cassandra. And if Cassandra is all over the document, you kind of want to bring up a sentence or two that mentions Cassandra, right? So that makes sense. But it's, it's kind of a naive approach. The second one is based on sentence similarity. And this, the particular approach that I'm going to talk about here goes back to section one, where again, terms are treated as vectors, and we're just doing some comparison on these vectors. So, uh, okay, let's look at this. You don't have to read through all of this. Uh, this, this is basically the 11 sentences that were part of the current Wikipedia entry about Apache Cassandra. So it says Apache Cassandra is an open source project, blah, offers robust support, places high value on performance, researchers conducted some study, data model is tunable, blah, right, all of these. In my mind, the first two sentences are extremely important because they give out, I mean, they said it's an open source, a distributed database management system, can handle large amounts of data. Uh, and this is again subjective, but what you see on the right is well, my subjective rating on how important something is. So now we can take this and we can run it through an approach known as text rank, and the link for that paper is over here. And the text rank approach is very simple. It basically says every sentence is a vertex on a graph, and every edge has a weight corresponding to how similar they are. So if you have the old example, the rose is red and uh, I forgot, the red shoe, then they have one common term, which is a red. So that would be, that would kind of signify how similar they are. So if you take this for every sentence and compare it with every other sentence, you get an N by N matrix. And in like most machine learning and math terminology, that's basically called a similarity matrix. And when you have a similarity matrix, the diagonal is all one because they are exactly similar to each other. I and J would always be similar to each other, but the non-diagonal terms give you an idea of how similar the document is to other document, uh, the sentences to other sentences. Once you have this n by n uh, matrix, what you can do is you can just sum, this, sum the similarities of every row, and with, with that you get an idea of how one sentence is similar to all other sentences. Once you do that, you just bring up the top case sentences as results. So if I was building an app for the phone and I wanted to say, I just wanted to bring out three sentences for every big document out there, then all I would do is build a similarity graph. And ideally, you should kind of bring out the number of sentences as a, as a ratio of how big the document is, because you know larger documents warrant bigger summaries. Uh, but yeah, so you just do that. It's a brute force approach, but it works and it'll give you the results that you want. Good question. Yeah. yeah. So it seems like a, an approach like that, though, where you're looking at kind of like how it matches one sentence with the other sentences, um, especially for kind of the sum of the views, you would kind of miss uh, things where people restate their point, right? Like people, you know, in terms of an essay or something like that. No, that's a good point. So we, uh, we were trying this on uh, like song lyrics, right? Chorus is repeated a whole bunch of times. So you kind of have to do some post-processing. And uh, this, uh, I think the biggest idea here is to say that this is such a simple thing, and it's something that is not very intuitive. When you think of document summarization, it, thinks, it seems like this big thing that people are doing, and the idea is to provide how simple it is. But you can do those post-filtering, and you can kind of figure out, like, you know, if I was to do that, I would make sure that after my first rank list was in, that the other two didn't have a high rank, or I would do like a vector analysis or something like that to avoid that problem but that's valid, and uh, yeah. So run it through this. This stuff is available on the GitHub co code as well. So if you run it through this, uh, you basically sum up each of those rows. You find that that is the top sentence, Cassandra offers, which is something that I expected. The second one, not so much, but I think one of the things that it had going for it is that it was a short sentence that captured Cassandra and performance, and it was able to match with a, a lot of other sentences. So that's probably the, so the way this algorithm works is because you're doing, you're doing a set intersection, the shorter sentences that are more content will also be ranked well. So a normalization happens implicitly as part of this. So that's the one. So the last question is, can, so the similarity metric was kind of raw, but can that be improved? And the answer is obviously yes. Everything that we have seen about semantic relatedness of words and stuff like that, 
instead of just treating these terms as vectors, you could go into WordNet and you could find out, you know, if you were able to do disambiguation, you could find out what they corresponded to. You could walk up and down the tree and figure out how semantically related they are. But that's not something, yeah, that's, that's, that's an approach that we can take. Okay, now we're moving to the last one or two topics. Dependency analysis, uh, this is more of, you know, for your information to know that there's stuff like this available. Uh, Stanford NLP can take a sentence with a good level of accuracy and split it into its parts. Where this comes in handy is so that now you, we got out of terms, we got out of even parts of speech, but now we can actually say what the relationship between different entities in a sentence are, and you can kind of find, figure out what the subject of the sentence is, what the object of the sentence is, and you know, and as long as it's accurate, you can you can provide like you for example, we use this to figure out what the point of view in a particular song was. You know, there are like four points of view. You have a direct address, your first, second, and third person. And we were able to just look up the different subjects that were mentioned and the objects that were mentioned and figure out who is this, who is the audience for this. And that something like this can basically help in a bunch of stuff like that. It can also handle negation. This is again very important because when you have concepts, you kind of want to know, especially for sentiment analysis, you want to know, is it being mentioned in a negative light or a positive light? So it can pull up negation. Uh, this is just a list of stuff that it covers. Um, and you know, again, the Stanford NLP will point to that. Uh, they had, this is one dependency analyzer. I think they have a neural networks based one, but the idea is very simple. Uh, what is Siri doing, right? An example like, you know, where is the nearest Starbucks? Or where is the nearest Mexican restaurant? In all of these structures, the structure is very similar, right? It can actually basically figure out what you're asking if it's able to parse all of this stuff and figure that out. So question, question parsing and question answering system, once you're able to parse this, then you can go to any sort of database, build your own queries, you know, uh, generate, generate stuff that something like Elasticsearch or Mongo will be able to answer and basically return the results. So all that you need to do question answering is Provide a robust way to parse and understand questions. Provide the translation layer that the database can understand and do that. Uh, it's easier said than done, but that's the, that'd be the approach. Um, dependency analysis works well for short sentences. It loses accuracy because you're going to this depth. Again, um, re-emphasizing the fact that it, it really depends on what the data was trained on. You will get results as well as your text is representative of the training, uh, training set text. Um, it may also aid in text simplification. So this has been one of those things, you know, a commercial application is this, you know, if you have, if you want to simplify text and if you want it, want it to be some, uh, want someone who's not that familiar with the language to understand, you can basically do it. So an example would be, you know, John, who's the CEO of the company, plays golf. You can basically take that and make two sentences out of it. You can say, John plays golf, John is the CEO of the company. And that may be some, easier for someone to understand. It, it may be easier for a computer to understand. Um, by analyzing the subject and the object, we can establish a point of view. Uh, could potentially help in story extrapolation, but that is a really, really hard problem. Uh, because when you're trying to figure out a story and with natural language the way it is, going back and forth and trying to figure out what is happening is extremely hard, but uh, is, is up for research. Okay, and the last topic here is sentiment analysis. And, um, <clears throat> Stanford NLP has a deep learning model for sentiment analysis. So I try to use this as is and obviously try to do some training on it as well. But in general, this has been trained on movie reviews. It works really well when you have short sentences that talk about something. It doesn't generalize well beyond that. So I'll also do, I'll try to do a quick demo and you can see links to it and you'll see a whole bunch of questions that people are asking. But the good thing about it is that they have done a deep parsing analysis. They've tried to figure out how to do sentiment analysis. So this is not, so most sentiment analysis tools out there uh, will just basically look at the surface level of what you're talking about and try to give you an answer. But Stanford NLP goes, the, the training data, so the way they achieved this training is basically, uh, they had uh, um, Mechanical Turks, Amazon Mechanical Turks, go in and hand annotate short sentences. And then they figured out the structures of those sentences, and then they were able to use that for training. Um, so this is kind of how it looks like. The taxonomy is simple. They have five different sentiments, very negative, negative, neutral, positive, and very positive. And this is kind of like, you know, since they have all the parsing done, they're able to split the sentences up. And you can kind of see where, like you can see how the negative negativity propagates upwards. So slow and repetitive. 
kind of created that whole no to be negative, which created that part of the sentence to be negative. But interesting and that whole tree up there made it positive. And I think this ends up being a positive sentence overall. So again, this is good for very, uh, this is good for sentences. It didn't really work for document. And uh, let's try to see if we can just do like, a, if you, even if you don't do a demo, like basically see what is available out there. But this would be another thing, you know, you can look at the slides and you can basically go to this link and figure out um, how to use that. I'll come back to, okay, hang on. Why is it so slow? Yeah, so if you say, Should basically be able to say, yeah, horrible, you did that. So, uh, but what's interesting is if you walk down this whole questions that people ask and they get a lot of them wrong as well, but luckily for them, they are retraining their model continuously. So uh, this particular system uh, is the best out there currently uh, for short sentences. But I would again say this works really well for review and review like data, doesn't really extrapolate uh, well to other cases. So provides good results. One of the big disadvantages, uh, no good way to aggregate sentiments across a document. So in theory, the way to solve that problem would be to do this whole parsing at the document level, not necessarily just at the sentiment level. And um, what I have been shown an example of here is that Stanford NLP also does co-referencing, which is when you say John, but then in the future you mention it as he, it'll try to, re it'll try to recognize that the he corresponds to John and will try to co-reference it. So in theory, we should be able to build some sort of a graph based on analyzing a document and looking at what it talks about and do it. Again, it's an extremely hard problem to solve. So like I said in the beginning, we start with what's proven and easiest and we walk down the list and it gets harder and harder, but uh, kind of keeps it interesting. <coughs> All right, final thoughts. Stanford NLP is employed in uh, text retrieval and search. Uh, while I'm talking about this, let me just make sure that this comes up. Okay, so it's a, it's a shallow NLP is employed in text retrieval and search and provides very good results for general use cases. Search is obviously a problem that's been well solved or on its way to being well solved. There are some cases where search engines are getting enhanced with like semantic information. Uh, deep NLP involves semantic parsing, common sense <coughs> interpolation, both local and global knowledge bases and tends to be harder. That's true and it's just a hard problem to solve. And so, the two points of advice is that I've seen people do some of the same things that we have done for specific domains. So if you have a problem in a specific domain that you're trying to solve, you will make a lot more inroads by picking some of these approaches because the, every domain has certain nascent features that are only true to that domain. So I've seen good results of people demoing this stuff. Uh, last year at the machine learning conference in Atlanta, we had a startup in New York who were doing that for legal documents. They were basically able to automatically parse through a whole bunch of legal documents and figure out the parts of it where the lawyers needed to pay attention. But the legal documents follow a particular format. So once you have that, you can definitely achieve that. Uh, and the same similar case for us, I think that if we had tried to go in and try to solve the natural language processing problem, we would have made no progress whatsoever. But we were picking a domain and it kind of helped and we were able to make lots of progress on that. Medical records is another good case, and there are specific ontologies just for medical records that you can use as well. Okay, so two cents on intelligence. I was gonna say it's my two cents on intelligence, because, but it is really not my two cents, it's that guy's two cents. If you go to Wikipedia and look up on intelligence, this is a book that I read about 10, 11 years back, it came out, and one of the biggest things that is missing in a system like this, or in, in most machine learning systems, is memory. A lot of our intelligence comes from memory. So the things that we understand, the things that we find hard, all of that has to do with our actual permanent memory that we have in our head. So intelligence is not just about solving problems logically. It's about the patterns that you've already seen and using that to solve new problems. So this is a really good book that Wikipedia will point to a book, it's called On Intelligence, and he talks in detail. So that's a guy that was part of the early Palm Pilot uh, phones, he was building the handwriting recognition software, and he's got some really good ideas, and he's still working in the field. So that's definitely a resource to check out. And then let me try to see if this is up. Okay. 
right. So this is something that Gunnar showed me when I was basically making a proposal to do this talk. This is IBM's uh, demo. Uh, I know, last but not the least, no mention of NLP will be complete without mentioning Watson and what they have done. Uh, it's a pretty phenomenal system. They have tons and tons of people working on it. Uh, you know, all, I think even as recent, I mean, a month or so ago, I saw like a couple of PhDs going there. So they have truly built a system that can, you know, combines a lot of common sense. And I think that they will be the first one to get something out there that is actually solvable. And I, if I remember right, they even had something as a service. So here's a whole bunch of text as a, as a sample, and you basically hit analyze. And it's able to, I'll take a second because of a slow network, but it's usually pretty fast. So it'll basically parse this entire document and like characterize it. So this link is available. So if it doesn't show up right now, uh, which I'll be surprised that it doesn't. I should just connect to my own phone. That'll be faster than that. Okay, anyways, uh, you can look at it. It's basically, it provides a result of like an overall <coughs> analysis of the document, so. Okay, these are the, all the resources that we talked about, um, all the links, and then the second one on, on there. So since most of the, all, almost all of the stuff that I did was for Mosaic, I, that's not code that's available. I've tried to provide some sample set of some of the things that we did and some of the general purpose ways to do that. That's available on the GitHub repository. Uh, obviously, this is uh, code that's not really been used by anybody, so you will find some issues. Just let me know if you're trying to use it. Excuse me. And then a DBPDS spotlight and all the usual stuff. <coughs> and with that, we are done. Thanks for listening. And that's my Twitter account. If you want to be my 18th follower, that position is still up for grabs. <laughs>